Good afternoon, everyone. I am doing my presentation on Johnson grass. It is it a friend or a forage foe? Johnson grass, or the scientific name is sorghum halipens, is a perennial warm season grass that is native to the Mediterranean. There's a few different stories about how it got to the United States. The most commonly accepted story is that in the 1830s, the governor of South Carolina, John Hugh Means, was contacted by um, people in Turkey wanting help on growing cotton. Governor Means sends someone to help. That person comes back with several different types of seed. One of those ended up being Johnson grass. He grew it, he liked it. In the 1840s, he had a visit from Colonel William Johnson who saw the grass growing. He also liked it. He took seed with him back to his plantation that was close to Selma, Alabama. From there, it spread quickly. At any time, Johnson grass has been known by eight different scientific names and 40 common names. Two of the most common, common names were Guinea grass and Means grass. The term Johnson grass actually was not used until 1874. By 1895, Johnson grass had spread so quickly and was being considered a weed in several states that the Texas legislator actually passed a bill that prohibited and made it a penal offense for someone to plant Johnson grass on property that they did not own. In 1901, they passed another bill making it illegal for railroad companies to plant Johnson grass in their right of ways. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on identification. I'm sure every one of you has seen Johnson grass a number of times, but the kind of four big key identifiers are the white midvein, the triangular panicle, rhizomes that we'll talk more about here in a minute, and hairy ligule. The habitat, where is it growing? It is adapted to a wide range of soil types, um, anywhere from five to seven and a half, and one paper said that it prefers fertile lowland soils, but I'm sure you and I both know it can grow, seems like anywhere. And where can it be found? Pastures, roadsides, orchards, just everywhere. It, it does not discriminate really. How is it getting to these places? Well, it spreads through seed or through rhizomes. The seeds will germinate when soil temperatures reach around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The rhizomes, uh, new shoots will start from them uh, right around 60 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature. And those sprouts from the rhizome will develop faster than seedlings because those rhizomes accumulated carbohydrates during winter. So they had a little bit more food storage there to get them started. Um, and we as humans also help the spread of Johnson grass. If we are not cleaning off our equipment from one field to the next, we can spread it. We can also spread it if we're feeding hay that has Johnson grass in it. And of course, animals, birds uh, are prone to carry the seeds. I've had several people tell me that they only have Johnson grass underneath the power lines or that that's where they first noticed it. So do we control it or do we manage it? Well, if you want to control it to the point of eradication, good luck. It's going to be difficult, time consuming and costly. So some ways you can try to do this, um, and there's no guaranteed successes necessarily with this, is fall plowing to a depth of three to five inches. It's important to do this in the fall so that you are exposing those rhizomes to uh, killing temperatures. Uh, now, if you disc, you need to go in with an herbicide application as well. If you only disc, you are just cutting those rhizomes up, splitting them apart, and giving them the opportunity to sprout from the rhizome. So you need to go in with an herbicide. It is recommended to use the post-emergent style herbicides uh, when the Johnson grass is actively growing and is at least 18 to 24 inches tall. You can also control it or manage it through close grazing or frequent mowing. I have several producers tell me, I only have it in my hay field. I don't have it in my pastures. Well, you probably have it in your pastures. You just don't see it because the cattle are grazing it. They actually like it. Um, now this next little bullet point here, um, I don't know that there's any research that would back this up, but what we have found to work as kind of a means of managing Johnson grass in our hay fields 
is uh, after you're first cutting a pay, which is usually when you're going to see the Johnson grass really shoot up, before it gets to seed head, go in with your bush hog, sit high, knock that back, allow your other forages to kind of catch up, then go in and cut your hay. If you allow that hay, or if you allow that Johnson grass to get up six, seven, eight feet tall and then cut it for hay, you've got a whole lot of stem there that the cattle aren't going to eat. So you've got a lot of waste in your hay and then you've wasted your time. Um, if you have Johnson grass in your hay fields, it's really important to focus on the quality, not the quantity of hay that you're putting up. There are some crop concerns with Johnson grass. It is an overwintering reservoir for viral corn disease, and there are more than 20 species of aphids that can vector the maize dwarf mosaic virus that goes from Johnson grass to corn. In 96, Roundup Ready soybeans hit the market. In 97, Roundup Ready cotton hits the market. So, um, of course, and we know there's Roundup Ready corn now as well. So those row croppers that were having a huge issue with Johnson grass, because they now have uh, Roundup Ready sources available to them, that really helps them to control Johnson grass. So let's go back to the forage quality side of things. If you manage it properly, you have a good quality forage available to you. Um, in the vegetative state, crude protein can range from 10 to 14 percent, TDN 55 to 60 percent, and you're looking at a yield of two to five tons per acre. We might ask, how does this compare to other forage varieties? Well, tall fescue, you're looking at around 14 percent crude protein, orchard grass around 15 percent crude protein. Both of those have a TDN of around 66 percent. In tall fescue, very similar in yield, two to five tons per acre. So if you manage that Johnson grass and are cutting it for hay at the right time, you've got a, a forage that is fairly comparable to tall fescue or orchard grass. There have been some grazing trials done with Johnson grass. The Noble Foundation did one um, using 14 different warm season perennial grasses. In the first year of that trial, Johnson grass was the preferred species. In year two, uh, it was second. I think Bermuda grass was the preferred uh, grass that year. And then I think it was in uh, 1963, another trial was done um, and Johnson grass again was the preferred species there. So why aren't people managing Johnson grass in terms of forage? Well, they're concerned about cyanide toxicity. The long, uh, there, there's, long story short on cyanide is that uh, that animal will consume the plant material, chew it up, swallow it, then cyanide is released. That cyanide gets absorbed into the bloodstream and prevents hemoglobin in the red blood cells from releasing oxygen. So ultimately that animal will die from lack of oxygen. Uh, whether plant maturity can affect the levels of cyanide in the plant, um, like several other species we've talked about, you know, the younger the plant, the more um, toxic it is. Whether uh, it can be, have more cyanide presence if you've had a, a rapid flush of growth after maybe some rains. Drought is a big concern with Johnson grass or any of the sorghum species, and um, after a frost is also a concern. And there's even been some studies that have found that after an herbicide application, particularly with 2,4-D, that those cyanide levels are increased. So I'm also doing, uh, for my master's program, research about Johnson grass. Right now, there is not a field test that you can go out and do and say there's X amount of cyanide present in this Johnson grass. Um, there is a test paper that you can use that um, you can rip up the forage, put some water in there, put the test strip in, seal the bag up, put it in a warm place. That warm um, air kind of um, promotes the cyanide release and you just wait and watch that test paper to see um, if it changes color from kind of a pale green to blue. And it can be a light blue, it can change to a kind of a 
a UK blue or it can go to a, a much darker blue. And it can take five minutes, 10 minutes, it can take over an hour to see a change. But there's not any information that tells you if it changes in this amount of time or you get this color change, how much cyanide is then present. All you can say is yes, it's there or no, it's maybe not there. So in my research, we're using um, wild cherry leaves to see if they can be used as a suitable control or reference sample to measure cyanide levels in Johnson grass. And we're also looking to see if storage conditions affect cyanide levels that are released from cherry leaves in Johnson grass. Friday, I did the, my repetitions in my office of um, the dried Johnson grass and the frozen Johnson grass, both times using dried cherry leaves as a control. You can see there on the left, that is the air dried Johnson grass, which would be similar to hay and um, the cherry leaves there on the bottom. You can see there is no color change in that test strip um, in the Johnson grass at the top. Uh, it's right here. And then for the cherry leaves, you can see we've got a blue change here. So all I can really tell you about this sample based on these strips is that Yep, looks like there's cyanide here. No, doesn't look like there's cyanide here. Which if you'll remember from previous lectures with Dr. Henning, Johnson grass is one of the few times that the forage quality improves after you cut the hay because those cyanide levels dissipate as the, the Johnson grass dries out. Now, if you come over here and look, got my Johnson grass on top. This is what came out of the freezer and cherry leaves here at the bottom. And it's kind of hard to tell with the glare, but here in this corner, there's a little bit of color change with the cherry leaves, but you can see quite a bit of change up here with the Johnson grass. So I can tell you there's cyanide levels here, but I can't tell you how much. I can't tell you if that forage is safe for your animals to consume or not. So that's what we're hoping to find out with this research. We're sending these, um, samples off. I've got more dried leaf or dried Johnson grass, more um, frozen Johnson grass, and also more dried leaves we're going to send to a lab in California to see if we can somehow quantify this level of change, this color change or in the time of change. See if that somehow correlates to the levels of cyanide present so that as producers or as agents we can go out and run these tests in the field and have a better understanding of the cyanide levels and if it is in fact going to be an issue for our animals. And just some fun or maybe not so fun facts if you consider Johnson grass to be a weed. Rhizomes have been found more than 47 inches deep in cultivated soil. Five-year-old seeds um, have displayed 50% viability. A single plant can produce 200 to 300 feet of rhizomes in one month, and 10 bushels of seed can be produced on one acre in a growing season, and one plant can produce 80,000 seeds. So just some interesting tidbits to leave you with. If you all have any questions, feel free to ask.